Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. Susan came to Barclays Bank and talks to a bank clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. What can I do for you? Good morning. I'd like to open a bank account. What kind of account do you want? I'm not quite sure. I'll be a college student. I simply require a safe place to keep my money and easy access to it. Can you recommend an account for me? All right. Uh, do you get a grant? No, I will be supporting myself. I see. You could open an instant account. What's an instant account? Basically, it's an interest account. It has all the usual current account facilities such as a cash card and a deposit book, except a checkbook, and pays competitive interest on your account when it's in credit. There are two levels of interest for this account. If your balance is up to £500, the interest is 5.25%. If your balance is 500 or over, it attracts an even higher rate of interest which goes up to 7.25%. You will receive a cash card for our machines, so you can withdraw money with the card from any machines or any Barclay branches when the bank is closed. Oh, I see. How can I withdraw money if I have no checkbook? Well, you have to withdraw money either using your card or visiting your branch. I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. How can I find out how much money I have in my account? You can ask your branch and tell them how often you would like to receive your statement, which provides you with a permanent record of income and expenditure. It will show every transaction on your account and the balance remaining at the end of each day. You can also use your cash card to check your balance. That's fine. I think I'll open an instant account. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk about the women's conference. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. There will be two meetings held in Beijing, and they will overlap. 
1. The NGO, Non-Governmental Organization Forum on Women, will be held in Beijing from August the 30th to September the 8th, 1995. The other one, the Fourth World Conference on Women, FWCW, of the United Nations, will be held in Beijing from September the 4th to the 15th, 1995. Why is the UN, United Nations, holding these meetings? The UN has noticed that discrimination against women has been increasing. The UN definition of discrimination, any distinction, exclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the purpose of deciding or not, allowing the full recognition of a woman on the basis of equality between male and female, human rights, freedom in political, economic, social, cultural or other fields. Women are discriminated against in every country of the world. The UN has issued policies to deal with the discrimination. The UN has also placed the improvement of women's status position high on the global agenda. The world is getting smaller. We are becoming a global family that shares problems and difficulties. We can learn from one another, help one another, and share ideas and information. There have been three previous world conferences on women. First in Mexico City in 1975, second in Copenhagen in 1980, and third was in Nairobi in 1985. During the first conference held in Mexico City in 1975, which was during the International Women's Year, one outcome was the declaration by the UN General Assembly for Decade for Women, 1976 to 1985. In Copenhagen in 1980, the participants adopted a program of action for the second half of the UN Decade for Women. The 1985 Nairobi Conference was held at the end of the UN Decade for Women, and the results were published in a book called The Forward-Looking Strategies, which provided a framework for action at the international, national and regional levels of government and groups to promote greater equality and opportunities for women. The slogan for the UN Decade for Women was Equality, Development and Peace. This year, from the end of August until the middle of September, Beijing will hold two conferences. They are separate conferences, but related. The NGO Forum 95, from August the 30th to September the 8th, about 30,000 participants, both women and men, are expected to attend. It will be about women, their lives and their perspectives. This will provide women around the world with an opportunity to discuss and develop ideas, perspectives, plans and strategies and share information to celebrate women's achievement and contributions in society and to draw attention to and develop solutions to the discrimination facing women worldwide. Who can participate in the NGO Forum 95? Any individuals or groups who fill in an application form and send 50 US dollars to NGO Forum, New York, by April 30th, 1995, who will attend the Fourth World Conference. Each member state of the UN will send an official delegation. There are 184 member states in the UN. Also, any person that represents an organization which has received accreditation. This had to be done by January 13th, 1995. 6,000 people are expected to attend this conference. There has been over three years of preparations for this conference in Beijing at the international, national and regional levels in all the participating countries. The preparation committee has organised all the issues into ten categories. The conference in Beijing will discuss all these issues. At the end of the conference, the UN will issue a Platform for Action the Platform for Action will address the following critical areas of concern. Now look at questions 15 to 20.
Listen to the following directions and answer questions 15 to 20. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome to this afternoon's tour of the campus. I'll be your guide for the duration. Before we start, could I please ask you to look at your campus map? That's the one you just got when you came in. Because the university buildings are not quite spread out, the tour will be on foot. Now, let's start where we are, the main building. As you come out of the main building, you will see two other big buildings opposite you. One is the campus branch of the Midland Bank on your left. The other one is the post office. Then we will follow the Mary's Road until we come to the school lane. Here, on the opposite side of the road, you will see a huge white building directly on your left-hand corner. That would be the student's library. The student union is next to it, opposite the bank. Then we turn right and get into Candle Lane. There is a big shopping centre directly on the corner, and the science building is on the left-hand side. As we go down Candle Lane, past the shopping centre, we come to the school bookstore, which has a good reputation. All necessary course books can be bought there. Not the one next to the shopping centre, but the one after that, on the high street. Opposite the bookstore, there is the sports centre, which takes up the whole block between Mary's Road and Candle Lane on the high street. Finally, we circle back to the main building. The tour will last about an hour and a half. I hope you will enjoy this afternoon's tour. Oh, one more important note from Mr. Smith, your director. Please be back to this main building after the tour. There will be a reception at 5.30 in room 204 on the first floor in the lecture hall. You'll meet your teachers and staff there. All of you are welcome. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, David. Oh, hi, Mia. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in western France. Oh, fantastic. Over 13,000 years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations, as well as some signs. There are roughly 600 drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse. Hmm. Have a look at this graph. Hmm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see? First the horse, and then, after that, a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, OK. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, 
following the contours of the cave walls, but of course they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm, perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia. Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers, you do find pictures of fish,、oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first twenty meters inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here, okay. Then, off to the left, we have the painted gallery, which is about thirty meters long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly.、Oh. Then we find a second lower gallery called the Lateral Passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the Great Hall of the Bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the main gallery. At the end of the main gallery is the chamber of felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in nineteen forty, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings.、Uh. Then, in the fifties, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings, and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in nineteen sixty-three. Is that so? It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years the cave was suddenly open to the atmosphere, and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. You need a special permit to enter the cave now, and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art. Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, the authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the painted gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the eighteen thousand year old paintings.、Mm -hmm. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-Rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly, before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes but it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So, given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilised. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilise and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilisation is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilised and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the earth for a long time and the longer the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes, and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria, and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.